University. My name is Federico Fabrini. I am a professor of EU law, uh, the founding director of the Brexit Institute and uh, the PI of uh, the Jean Monnet Network Project Bridge. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me uh, to open this conference on migration and differentiation uh, in EU law and governance. Uh, as you know, uh, the event uh, taking place today and tomorrow uh, happens within the framework of the Jean Monnet Network uh, Bridge, uh, which is led by the Brexit Institute at DCU and also involves the Free University of Bolzano, the University of Copenhagen and Central European University. Uh, so let me say a few words uh, both about the Jean Monnet project uh, generally as well as about uh, the conference uh, specifically. As many of you know, Jean Monnet Network Bridge is a new funded three-year interdisciplinary project uh, which we launched in Dublin in October 2019. Uh, the aim of the project is to examine four recent uh, European crises, uh, Brexit, the Euro crisis, the migration crisis and the rule of law crisis, explaining their interplay as well as the consequences uh, that they have on the future of Europe. Uh, the idea behind the project uh, is that each crisis influences and in turn is influenced uh, by the others and that all together these four crises are reshaping European integration as well as uh, differentiated governance in the European Union. Uh, needless to say, a project of this size would not be possible by one uh, team, by one university only. So we have pulled together expertise from four universities. Uh, and I really want to acknowledge uh, the efforts and the commitment and the help that our partners, uh, particularly Stefania Baroncelli, Renata Uitz and Helle Krunke are putting into this uh, initiative. The Bridge Project fulfills its mission through a number of activities. First of all, we have a very dynamic uh, website uh, with research and policy, and I know many of you are contributing to that, but uh, more uh, is, is welcome, certainly, uh, by anyone interested. Uh, secondly, let me uh, say and emphasize that the Bridge Network has produced and launched in October last year a MOOC, a massive open online course uh, entitled uh, the European Union from crisis to recovery. Uh, we decided to anticipate the production of this uh, interactive online uh, freely open access tool, uh, obviously because of the pandemic uh, and this instrument is now there freely available for anyone interested uh, on uh, those issues. And then finally, besides the website and the MOOC, of course, the Bridge Project runs a number of conferences and multipliers event. After the kickoff, uh, which I've already mentioned, and despite COVID-19, uh, we were able to uh, organize an event in Bolzano under the leadership of Stefania Baroncelli on the topic of beyond the Euro crisis, COVID-19 and the future of Europe. Uh, that happened in October last year. And then in December last year, we had a follow-up multiplier event uh, at the European Central Bank on post-pandemic uh, economic governance. Uh, with today's and tomorrow conference, uh, we are moving the, our project and our focus uh, towards a new topic, that of uh, migration, the migration crisis and, and populism, uh, which will be continued also at the next conference to be held at the University of Copenhagen under the leadership of, uh, of Helle Krunke, and then subsequently at a follow-up multiplier event at the European Parliament. And by the way, this is why uh, I've kindly asked uh, Helle to chair the final high-level uh, policy debate uh, tomorrow afternoon so that we have a sort of virtual pass on of the baton uh, towards Copenhagen, uh, which will continue the work uh, in uh, the next uh, few months. Now, having said this about uh, the bridge network uh, generally, uh, let me say something more specific about today's conference and then move on to introduce uh, our, uh, our panelists. Uh, so, of course, uh, the conference uh, we are having uh, virtually in Dublin focuses on the migration crisis and its legacy on uh, the European Union. As you all know, the outburst of the migration crisis in 2015 uh, was a momentous event uh, for Europe. On the one hand, it challenged uh, the Schengen zone, uh, which is one of the most significant achievements uh, of European integration. Uh, but also, on the other hand, the migration crisis exposed 
growing rift uh, among uh, the member states and particularly uh, the difficulties in uh, putting together a coordinated response uh, among the member states uh, have shown an increasing drift towards differentiation uh, in the European Union. Uh, at the same time, and that's obviously a key point for us in the bridge project, uh, the migration crisis intersected with other crises. I said it before, uh, we want to keep a broad uh, perspective on that. Uh, first, migration interplayed uh, with the migration crisis interplayed uh, with the euro crisis. As, as a matter of fact, uh, the member states which were most exposed to the sudden influ influx of uh, asylum seekers were also those which had suffered the most as a consequence of the euro crisis and the responses to it. Uh, secondly, the migration crisis interplayed with the rule of law crisis as uh, the member states of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, which uh, opposed any effort uh, at uh, sharing the burden uh, in managing the crisis, are also the states, think of Visegrad and particularly Hungary and Poland, uh, which are drifting uh, more dramatically in terms of respect for the rule of law and democratic principles. Uh, and then third and finally, of course, the migration crisis uh, has been interplaying also with Brexit. Uh, migration was one of the big issues in the 2016 uh, referendum and ever since uh, it has remained as one of the soaring point of contentions in negotiations between uh, the European Union and the United Kingdom. So as you can see, there is really lots of uh, issues out there. And one of the key aim of this conference uh, is to put square and center the, the issue of migration within the Jean Monnet project, uh, but also to examine the multiple dimension uh, of the migration crisis, contributing to contextualize it uh, and reflecting on the legal and policy developments. Uh, let me just say one thing about the timing of this event, which I believe uh, makes it particularly interesting for the purposes of our conversation. Uh, indeed, uh, since the beginning of the, of the crisis, now five years ago, there have been efforts uh, to improve uh, the resilience of the European system, uh, common European asylum system. But, you know, efforts have been uh, not really matched by successes and, and results. And yet, I think one can spot a new momentum or at least a new impetus uh, towards dealing with these important issues, uh, especially in connection uh, with the uh, recent commission proposal for uh, a new uh, migration pact, partially also because of uh, COVID-19 and uh, what the pandemics have emphasized in terms of weaknesses uh, of the European Union. So we are starting off uh, the conference today with a panel which is entitled From the Migration Crisis to the New Migration Pact, uh, the purpose of which uh, is really to set the scene uh, and identify some key issues uh, which will then be spelled out uh, in subsequent panels of, of this event. And I'm really delighted to say we have put together a stellar interdisciplinary panel uh, with political scientists, anthropologists, sociologists, uh, and lawyers. Uh, therefore, without further ado, let me just move very quickly to introduce uh, our speakers, uh, which uh, in the order in which they are going to present uh, this afternoon. So the first in line, is Leila Haji uh, Abdu, uh, who is assistant professor at the Faculty of uh, Political Science of the University of Vienna, which she joined quite recently in October 2020. Uh, she uh, holds a PhD in social and political sciences from the European University Institute, where she also worked for a number of years as a research fellow at the Migration Policy Center. Uh, Leila has been a research fellow at the uh, School for Advanced International Studies at John Hopkins uh, in Washington, D.C., as well as at the CNRS uh, in France, and she is a prolific author in the field of uh, migration, uh, having written just very recently, among other, a book entitled Migration and Mobility in the European Union, published by uh, Macmillan and co-authored uh, with Anthony uh, Geddes. Second speaker in uh, our panel this afternoon is then Susan Rotman, uh, who is assistant professor at Ozegin University in Turkey. Uh, Susan holds a BA in comparative religion from Cornell University, an MA in anthropology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she also received her PhD in anthropology uh, in 2012. Uh, Susan has published extensively in the field of cultural anthropology and migration, and she is also the PI of the EU-funded Horizon 2020 project called RESPOND, 
uh, multi-level governance of mass migration in Europe and beyond. And I shall say, Susan is also a very close friend of the Jean Monnet Network Bridge. Uh, she spoke at our kickoff event in October 2019 in Dublin, and she has provided invaluable assistance uh, in our effort to launch a MOOC uh, last fall. So it is a pleasure to have you here once more with us, uh, Susan. Then the third speaker, and in fact, the only male in a very gender unbalanced panel we have this afternoon uh, is Filippo Scuto, uh, who is associate professor at the Department uh, of International Legal and Political Studies of the University of Milan, the former uh, Faculty of Political Science. Uh, Filippo teaches uh, constitutional law and, and immigration law. He has a PhD in law from also from the University of Milan. Uh, he has been in charge of several Jean Monnet projects uh, and he has been also a, for a long time a collaborator of the Center for the Studies of Federalism in Turin, uh, which is uh, where uh, him and I first met uh, many, many uh, years ago. And then finally, uh, the panel also includes Vladislava Stoyanova, who has not yet uh, joined us. Um, she informed me just minutes ago uh, that uh, she had caring uh, responsibilities for her four-year-old child, but I am hopeful uh, she might be able to log in uh, at a later moment uh, this, uh, this afternoon. And let me just say that uh, Vladislava uh, is Associate Senior Lecturer at the Law Department of Lund University uh, in Sweden, uh, where she's working in the field of international human rights law and refugee law. Uh, she has obtained her PhD from Lund University and uh, she won the Lund Society of Humanities and Social Sciences Award for the best PhD thesis uh, in 2016. As I said, I hope uh, Vladislava will, will be with us, but I thought it made sense to interview her, uh, to, sorry, introduce her already, uh, already now. Um, Having said this, and before I move on to the first speaker, let me just uh, provide to the audience a couple of technical information. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to emphasize for uh, GDPR purposes that we are recording uh, this event. Uh, this is, at the end of the day, a public event, which will we make uh, available as requested uh, by our sponsors, uh, the European uh, Commission. And then in terms of um, how the system works for question and answer, uh, you have two options if you want to address any query uh, to the panelists. You can either send me a message on the chat function, and I will then uh, read it out uh, uh, loud, or otherwise you can raise your hand virtually and then either myself or uh, Catherine Martin uh, or administrator uh, will enable you to switch on your mic and video so that you can uh, directly uh, speak for any issue in any case. Uh, do write uh, to me on the chat. I will be uh, checking that as we speak. But I have spoken for longer than I wish, so I'll stop here. And without further ado, I'll hand over straight the floor to Leila. Thanks for being with us. Benvenuta, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Federico, and thanks to you, especially and all the organizers and the members of the network um, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to meet all of you. Some of you already knew, um, but still, so now it's an enlarged um, meeting, though only virtually. Normally, I really enjoy it as an academic having to travel less, to be honest, but in this case, I don't, because Dublin is one of my favorite cities where I did my PhD also, about Dublin and partly in Dublin, so the more it's a pleasure at least to be with you virtually. So I will try to share my screen now. Um, let me see. Okay. Does it work? Can you see it? Yes, perfect. So now I just have the only thing to switch. Does it also switch here? Um, okay, one second, the photos, okay. So here, so basically, yes, as I'm the first, I tend a little bit also to contextualize the issue from a political science perspective, as I am a political scientist. And so to look a little bit at the evolution of the policy development and the effects uh, on European integration. Basically, my paper is entitled The Status Quo Problem, um, and I will, um, because I argue that basically uh, one of the major problems is the continuity of the status quo so far. But let me, so here we go. So really my objective of this uh, short contribution is um, to add to scholarly debates about the ongoing institutional crisis of the EU in the framework also very much of the bridge network 
and by examining the current state of communitarization in the migration and asylum domain. Um, in a nutshell, the core arguments I have and I outlined also in the paper is um, that the migration crisis wasn't the critical juncture, so to say, it didn't change the path um, and the subsequent policy developments that came from the crisis basically amplified existing tendencies rather than disrupting the status quo. And here I very much base also my analysis on, on Trauner and Ripoll Servant, but also Genschel and Yachtenhoek, so very important also for my reflections here. And also kindly, um, Federico mentioned also the book together with Andrew Geddes on migration and mobility. So much of this also what I present is based on this thinking from these scholars and my work together um, with Andrew. So here is also that they use migration and asylum policy core, um, basically stayed or remained consistent. And that also the, the type of integration, namely the regulatory approach also was one of the consistent features um, even um, since the migration crisis or basically since the establishment of, the, of this uh, field, EU cooperation in the field of asylum and migration. And particularly, as I will um, explain a little bit uh, later, this also part, this is uh, the regulatory type of approach of integration is particularly ill-equipped to deal um, with integration of core state powers such as migration and asylum. And I think the main point, what I want to highlight here from a political science perspective is that also the context of course obviously changed and this so-called opposition to EU integration uncorked, whereas previously it was not contested. Of course, we all are very much aware that it's now um, contested. And also, and this is also linked to migration and the field of migration policy. So what I say and what I argue is that the challenge for EU integration is not really a formal disintegration, but exactly this continuation of this policy core and the existing regulatory approach that induces implementation gaps and conflicts among member states. And on the other hand, what this means is that this leads to an increasing effort to externalize responsibility in the field of asylum and migration as opposed to necessary internal capacity building. But if capacity building is not addressed in the long term, this is how I conclude, is uh, this means that systemic failure will remain an issue. So this is very much the argument in a nutshell. And let me go to one of the main points and also what political science has contributed in understanding the policy development, namely to the changing political context of EU integration that I mentioned before. So very much what we saw, of course, is the restructuring of socio-political conflicts, um, which is often also described as the globalization cleavage. So winners and losers of globalization, as Hans Peter Grisi and, and his collaborators framed it. So and I think what is very important and what is more and more scholarly debate highlights that it's not only about um, winning and losing in terms of economic terms, but also very much a perception of a loss of status, of socioeconomic status. And so, but this uh, somehow, then when we look at public opinion data, what we see actually, there is no shift in public opinion. So people are not more uh, critical towards issues of migration, as <laughs> I, um, or bless you, somebody, um, or um, European integration in a sense, it's not more people being more critical so public attitudes are relatively stable. This is also true when we look at globalization more broadly and the effects. Um, so this remains stable, but what shifted is um, political behavior. And so, but what I said before, here's just some, some proof that I'm not inventing that public opinion remained relatively stable. So here is the latest Europe parameter data where you see actually the fairly positive really um, outnumber the Berlin people who are negative about the European Union. Same goes for attitudes to migration when you look at it. So again, like here, relatively fluctuation, but now like um, becoming fairly more positive even the attitudes. So it's not that we say that, okay, there is a big rupture, people really changed how they think about the issue, but political behavior changed. 
Why? Because the salience of the issue increased, it became more visible in, in public debates and so-called dormant concerns by people who have been holding already negative attitudes concerning these issues were activated. Um, I always cite also the example of climate change. Many of us were concerned about climate change, but it hardly was an issue that brought you to the voting booth. Um, whereas now, as it's a very salient issue, it does so. And the interesting case is that attitudes towards European integration and immigration tend to reinforce each other. And this again, of course, uh, translated in the, in the success of anti-migrant Eurosceptic parties at the ballot box because it, uh, these parties represented a meaningful electoral choice for people whose concerns were unaddressed before. So I think that's really the main point how we can understand or why we can also understand some gridlock is also through the lens of politicization. But now to jump immediately and Federico you also have to give me the time because now on my laptop I don't see the time and I turned off my mobile phone. <laughs> anyway, so but um, to, to cut things short, what were the effects of the migration crisis? So on one, so I said there was no big like breaking point, no big change, so to say. But of course, the salience of the migration matter increased further, which matters for politicization. But unlike previous historic crisis of the EU, we saw no big leap forward. Um, and, but also no formal disintegration, of course, but increasing in formal and horizontal forms of interaction between member states, as opposed to previous more vertical and formal types of Europeanization. And I think the point that really, it, which is the emphasis on my paper, is that we had no break with the policy core and this regulatory approach to common authorization state intact, which means basically no real institutional capacity building. So um, just to come to the policy core and the policy aims, so basically these were established, as also Florian Trauner and Ariadna ripoll Servan showed, these were established in the 1990s and early 2000s, and basically, they stayed the same. So always the sticking point Dublin regulation, we have it basically in some modified form since the 90s. Um, so, and, and also the other instruments of the common European asyl asylum framework remains largely in place. What does this mean? That also the inbuilt limitations of the original design remained very much in place. As did also policy emphasizes on stemming unwanted migration um, through externalization and external border control measures as opposed to developing common objectives on legal migration because of course this is where the European Union formally has no competences. Um, why, why do we say uh, see this stability of the policy core? Um, it's really how this policy field evolved when you look at it historically um, because it was the member states in the driving seats was very long in the governmental area and the council and the member state, they kept their cap capability of being the driving forces even post Lisbon. And I think that's really important to, to say. Um, and also, as I said, the second point is that there is this continuation, continuity, continuation of the regulatory approach and with a lack of necessarily institutional capacities. Um, why is this a problem? And I think here, uh, Genschel and Jachtenfuchs, their uh, ideas are very, very important and, and very, um, yeah, they, to the point, namely they say that before, when we look at European integration, market integration really differs from integration when it comes to core state powers. There is much more distributive challenges. The costs fall on the state um, as opposed to market actors, which means uh, in order to, to effectively communitarize and implement these common, uh, like common regulations, um, you, have, uh, you need um, institutional capacities at the nation state level. In other words, there is very high compliance costs. How to reduce these compliance costs is by EU capacity building. But actually, this is what no, did not happen. Yeah? So I think that's really important to say. And now to come um, more slowly to an end is the, the Pact on Migration and Asylum. Let's jump directly into this new um, policy document. So basically what it did, you can, in a, in a nutshell, it introduced flexible 
but obligatory mechanisms of solidarity regarding asylum seeking migration in combination with border procedures. I'm happy, of course, to discuss more, but this is just in a nutshell. Then, and of course, a continued emphasis on the external dimension and a comparatively minimalistic focus on legal migration. What you can say, um, maybe provocantly or maybe not, maybe it's just really what it is. Um, this pact is very much a concession to the Visegrad countries or what can be also in terms in EU integration policy seen as a cross loading of policy preferences by a group of like minded illiberal member states. Um, and also, I think when you follow the debates that led to the pact and, and the gridlock um, since the 2016 reform proposals of the common European asylum net, um, asylum framework, but also what you see now in the after the pact has been published that you see basically before I could say you had three different uh, clashing with visions, but now I think it distills into really two uh, uh, clashing, clashing visions. The one is about halting mi migration, stopping migration entirely. Um, so here it's just a citation from the paper, uh, from a non-paper by Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Estonia and Slovenia, which was published just after the publication of the pact proposal, who, um, who really represent an, an attitude that they are convinced that if uh, the external dimension is properly addressed and uh, the external borders are secured, so to say, then there will be no need for solidarity because there will be no migration. So this is the, the vision A and the vision B, B is basically keeping migration at bay uh, and seeing it's slightly more complicated than just by having not the illusion of just stopping it. Um, so and. So what we see that with the pact, the pendulum swings arguably more towards the vision of halting migration. Um, but also what you have to say, because academic uh, debates and scholars always ask for much more, ask for a much more open minded solution, a solution that sees migration not only as a problem, but also as a solution to different problems. But we have to be frank. In light of the current political realities, the proposed pact is probably the most feasible the Commission could do at this point of time if it wants to bring about some joint action in the field. So this is also suggested that so far we have some disaccord, but no overall opposition. So I think also scholars, as, as scholars, we have to somehow also be clear that political realities, of course, matter what the Commission can do. But also at the same time, we have to be clear that this but political realities are partly also the result of migration governance in itself, of EU migration governance. Because when you think about it, about the evolution, how um, so these restrictive migration reforms and prioritizing migration on the political agenda also very much have aimed initially at containing an anti-migration mood and the rise of anti-migrant political entrepreneurs. But by doing so, they have further increased the salience of the issue and contributed further to the politicization. So to come to an end, do I still have a one minute or how, how I'm faring with time, Federico? Yes, yes, you have two minutes. Okay. Um, so let's look at the prospects of the pact under the Portuguese uh, presidency. I think what can be said um, that Portugal is a EU member state which does not fall in either of the two camps. So in the two camps, meaning these different visions between halting migration versus keeping it at bay, but they have a rather depoliticized vision of migration. So at one hand, you can you could say um, that this is negative, that they really don't prioritize migration. So how can we expect that this will be go forward on the agenda? But on the other hand, you also could interpret it very positively saying, OK, they don't fall in either of these polarized camps. They have basically one of the few member states which has a depoliticized vision of migration. And another interesting thing is that we know that Portugal and they also showed it in the previous uh, presidencies that they have a rather multilateral vision. When you look at the PEC, the PEC um, refer, uh, does largely not refer to the international frameworks, just uh, such as the Global Compact on Migration, and is rather, as many have criticized, rather um, focused on European interests, also when it comes to partnerships with others. So here, also the Portuguese presidency, with its multilateral vision, could have um, some impact, I would say. 
but of course we also <laughs> being re realistic again about they also have a rather weak alliance base so what we know from portugal there is they are very much always oriented on their um, big neighbor spain this is true across all policy fields but even more so in the migration policy field so this is just like from the european council of foreign relations who measured this by um yeah these alliance bases so to come to an end now um so i think really the underlying challenge for european integration and communitarization of this field is really the politicized nature of the migration issue and this um, means that the issue is a highly symbolic one and not necessarily a quantitative burden but a symbolic burden um, so any viable solution has to tackle the issue of politicization first but this pandora box of the politicization has been opened long time ago so simply trying to put the lid back on it won't do the trick so I think, and this is where we have to continue our conversations and our thoughts that how can we change um, also these dynamics? And I think one way, one the most promising way is through input legitimacy um, of democracy, because given that there is little perceived input leg legitimacy, um, democracy and liberal democracy has been become more uh, contested, which also reflects then in the contestation of European integration and migration. Um, so likely future scenario. So given that sustainable internal solutions um, seem to be out of reach and especially institutional capacity building, what will remain for sure is this very strong focus on the external dimension since in these internal solutions can't be found. Um, so the question is uh, whether non-EU countries will uh, are willing to play along is of course another question and this has created lots of, of challenges also in the past and I think also very important question is at which costs for vulnerable and here yeah I'm already at the end so what is needed definitely this continuation of the status quo and some however partial and incomplete solutions that truly address the input limitations of the original design. But to end on a positive note and hand over to my colleagues, the potential of the pact in simply, simply keeping things going should not be underestimated either because it may create spaces and opportunities for institutional arrangements and capacities in the long run. Thanks so much. I hope I wasn't much over time. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Leila, for uh, setting the social social political context for the discussion and also for identifying the challenges that the new migration pact uh, is facing. I think that connects very well to uh, the research and work we are doing on uh, differentiation, in fact. But uh, without further ado, let me move straight uh, to Susan uh, for her own 15 minute of presentation. Susan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak here at the Bridge Network. I'm, I'm honored and enjoy this opportunity. Um, my presentation seems to be a really ideal um, continuation of what Leila has laid out. Um, she used the term status quo or continuity. I use the term continuum, but I think we see something similar. Um, so I titled my talk, A Politics of Belonging Lands on the Crisis Pact Continuum. And I want to kind of uh, hopefully convince you why a politics of belonging uh, is a one important way of looking at the situation and also why I also see a continuum in terms of the crisis and pact policy development. Um, so first, why belonging? So belonging can be defined as the capacity to identify with and feel attachment to a social group. Uh, when we're talking about the belonging of migrants, we mean usually to their new country, but it can also be, of course, we all have multiple um, myriad forms of belonging. Um, why does belonging matter? I mean, I think sometimes it's perceived as something subjective, less important than some other policy outcomes. Um, but it matters for a couple of reasons. First of all, it matters to migrants themselves. It fulfills psychological needs for all of us, for, for them as well. Uh, it matters for social cohesion and integration. So people who live in communities uh, with migrants uh, talk about belonging as part of what makes their community something meaningful to them. 
Um, and to some extent, it also can be seen as important to political leaders who place some kind of premium on national identity loyalty um, in, in terms of security. So uh, I would say that there are good reasons to care about how migrants feel belonging in um, different realms. Um, and the politics of belonging refers to the politics that has to do with how you maintain, reproduce, contest, challenge, and resist the physical and symbolic boundaries that separate individuals. Um, so uh, the idea is that there is always a uh, politics of belonging within all um, countries uh, and communities um, in terms of how uh, boundaries are made. Um, but in this presentation, I want to specifically talk about uh, migrants and specifically uh, refugee migration or asylum seeking migration. So um, I, uh, as I said, use the term um, continuum. Um, I'm thinking that what we see in these different developments since the crisis, which prompted the hotspot approach, the agenda on migration, the EU Turkey statement, the new pact finally, and then all, even also the action plan on integration and inclusion, which was recently released, uh, we see a kind of range of uh, the way that the policy, uh, the, the aim and the implementation of the policy um, ha is, is always present within a certain range. And this range has to do with uh, a kind of logic of focusing on logistics, deterrence, restriction, return, security um, in favor uh, or ab above the focus on rights, human rights, EU values. And part of this is tied into this narrative that asylum seekers, um, maybe some number of them are illegal or bogus or don't have the right. So there's a more focus on the ones who uh, need to be excluded as opposed to the ones who need to be included. Um, and uh, in general, um, integration is left kind of as the, um, you know, the later add on uh, as it is also in the action plan on um, integration and inclusion which even within itself mostly leaves integration to the member states. So it's not really promoting a minimum standard or model of integration. And uh, I wanna talk about what this signifies for belonging, but throughout all of this, belonging is basically absent. I mean, there's, this is not one of the main questions that are being dealt with in these policies. And um, to the extent that belonging maybe would come in a little bit in terms of action plan, um, it's a problem to divide people into asylum seekers and refugees so starkly as if somebody who passed it, who lived in a hotspot and then uh, travels through the asylum system and then uh, goes to another country will suddenly integrate. Um, these are people who are passing through the process, which is why I think we need to see these as connected somehow or what I call the continuum. So. Um, I'm drawing on this research uh, from Respond, uh, which was a study of migration governance along the Eastern Mediterranean route. Um, and it was a very empirical project um, in terms of a lot of interviews and uh, research with migrants and stakeholders, a lot of reports. So um, belonging was one aspect that was looked at within this um, broader project. Um, so in terms of the findings of belonging. Oh, I just, I also just want to say that the project itself is coming directly after the crisis and it's ending right now when the pact is coming out. So it's kind of an interesting, um, it fits well with this topic, crisis to the pact. So how, what's happening with belonging in these countries? Well, it's uh, very low. I mean, migrants are not feeling belonging, whether we're talking about asylum seekers or uh, refugees, um, and uh, if we ask why, I mean, one important reason is the politics of belonging, uh, I would say. So this idea of how uh, migrants uh, have a lot of legal insecurity and they're included and excluded in different ways. So in all of the member states that we studied, uh, all amendments and regulations after 2015 added restrictions to the existing rights or narrowed the protect access to the protection system. So everything was reduced, similar to what we see happening with the PACT. Um, and so um, we can say that what happens to people in during the asylum seeking process 
um, and continued insecurity when they're refugees contributes to lack of belonging is one feature of uh, is one reason for lack of belonging. So for example, uh, the report writers from Germany talk about how the state of being constantly anxious regarding one's status makes it feel like deportation is just around the corner, which has an impact on life in general, including language learning and overall living conditions. So this um, legal insecurity um, and the length of time that people spend in the asylum seeking stage uh, inhibits their later integration uh, feelings and abilities. And there are even some states like Austria where people's refugee status can be reevaluated after a certain period of time. So even after they become refugees, they don't necessarily have legal um, security. Or in Turkey, uh, all of the Syrian migrants are, have temporary protection status, which can also be removed. Um, and then um, another, just to give another example, in the UK report writers um, talked about the paternalistic approach of providing support and care during the asylum application process while not being allowed to work and earn money uh, constitutes a loss of autonomy to such a degree that many feel as though they have lost their dignity. So people who have lost their dignity through a process, um, this is gonna affect their belonging, uh, I would argue, uh, in the long term, not just as in the moment that it happens. Um, and then we can also talk about uh, discourses. And I think, um, Leila brought this up as well, this anti-immigration discourse, which uh, is um, you know, quite prominent in uh, many member states. Um, this is not something uh, that only, I mean, the, exact, the discrimination that migrants face, I think is obviously a problem for belonging. So if people specifically say that they experience racism, for example, this report on Sweden talked about going into a depression because of wearing a headscarf. Um, but refugees are also aware of the discourses. So the, the anti-immigration discourses both increase the discrimination and racism, but they also affect refugees' belonging. So refugees um, or, and or asylum seekers, um, you know, are become aware of anti-immigration discourses, and this also contributes to their belonging. And I would argue that the pact in itself is a way of continuing these or reflecting and these anti-immigration discourses. So for that reason, it's also um, concerning. I just want to talk just, just to briefly say that um, it's interesting to see how refugees are uh, or migrants are responding to these um, to this climate. Um, so if we say that integration is very much based on an idea of assimilation in many countries or some some scholars even would call it a racialized discourse of non-belonging. Um, how do refugees find a way to insert themselves in a society? Um, I would say there are two main discourses. One is this idea of this being kind of a responsible, self-managing individual. Um, so the refugees even, even will tell you that they are integrating themselves. They are learning the language. We have to do it. So the responsibility is on them. They, they definitely feel that. Um, and they try to comply with the dominant ideas about religion and culture in the society that they're in. So, the, so migrants in Turkey are very likely to talk about how they are religious and how that's important to them. Whereas in other countries, they're more likely to minimize their religiosity or the, the cultural differences between them and the host society are something they try to um, work with. So those are the findings from belonging that uh, from respond that I wanted to talk about. Now, what will be the implications of the pact? Uh, I mean, we don't know yet, but um, in general, uh, I would say one issue is that all refugees were once asylum seekers. So experiences during the asylum seeking stage have long-term impacts on integration and belonging. So if we are, if the pact is going to be increasing differences, such as the right of movement between asylum seekers and refugees, if it's going to be narrowing access to protection for asylum seekers via different kinds of screenings and increasing their feelings of insecurity, this is going to have a long-term impact on their belonging. So I think uh, those who become refugees, it will have a long-term impact on them. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, the, the way that the pact has a kind of way of thinking about securitization, restriction, return, these are very much, um, you know, in line with these anti-immigration discourses. And these discourses themselves, I mean, 
let's say you, even if you are a refugee who has been given the right to stay, if you know that politicians and policies are talking about returning others, this is going to affect your uh, feeling of inclusion. Um, and, you know, ironically, it, it's not clear that these restrictive policies um, will necessarily um, prevent migration. I mean, other research shows that it will actually, it could, could potentially um, increase irregular migration, smuggling, and actually spur migrants to try to settle and naturalize in the country. So it will have, just as their belonging is being negatively impacted, they may also be feeling pushed to uh, permanently um, reside and or try to reside in, in, in any way possible. Now, in terms of the action plan on integration and inclusion, um, obviously, I mean, it's a much more positive narrative. It's a much more pro-migration discourse, um, but we can still find a kind of securitization um, narrative within it. So the idea that integration, the purpose of integration is to prevent um, radicalization comes across in the document. Um, but I think uh, a bigger problem is the is that they really don't want to take responsibility for integration. They're saying that it relies with the member states. And um, so they're not putting forward um, shared EU norms or minimum standards. So we see so many differences in, in the different states with whether migrants have access to um, the labor market is, you know, how much time they have to wait before they can access is very different in different states or different states have very ge geographically isolated recession centers, which we know are not um, good for the mental health or integration of migrants. So there's a lot of, um, I, th I think there could be a role for the EU to kind of um, specify what should be uh, done in terms of integration in the different member states. So in conclusion, um, I mean, what can we do about this? Um, well, I mean, the first problem, I mean, and I would say I'm certainly not the first to say most of these things, these are quite well known, I guess, but um, the secure legal status is kind of the number one thing um, that needs to be, um, you know, re the, to the extent that migrants feel that their status is secure, not only that they know that they will become go from being asylum seekers to refugees, but when they're refugees, that they also feel security. Um, focus on human rights, um, integration standards, I think would be valuable. Um, Pro-immigration political discourses, yes, how can we change that? I think we definitely need more research um, and especially research on belonging. So we shouldn't just stop at policy research. We should understand how policies are um, perceived. Um, and um, in my opinion, um, I think that uh, what we see are policies that reflect people's fears and concerns about migration. And we need policies that will lead people to uh, feel differently so that will shape people. So we can use policy and law to shape opinion, not just reflect opinion, which seems to be what's happening now. And uh, I think we should care about belonging within this um, question because um, this is, something that's important to the migrants, it's important to the communities where they go, and it's also important to political leaders, at least to some extent. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Susan, for his fascinating presentation, which uh, also adds the almost psychological element uh, of, of migration through the perspective of belonging, and certainly complements very well what Leila uh, was talking to us about. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the way how did this, we designed the program of this panel uh, is, is really a continuity because we're now moving after the politics and the anthropological aspects, we're moving to the law uh, with uh, Filippo Scuto, uh, to whom I give the floor uh, without uh, saying anything more at this stage. Filippo. Thank you, Filippo. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me on this meeting. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, uh, this new pact uh, um, saw the light uh, in a context in which uh, the enormous difficulties uh, of the European common policy on migration and asylum are apparent. We could, we could also say that uh, we could also talk uh, about a failure 
of the European Union common policy on this field. Uh, in, my in my presentation, I will focus uh, in particular on the PACT's uh, provisions uh, with regard uh, to the right to asylum and to the action against uh, irregular or illegal uh, immigration. Uh, let's start uh, talking about uh, the matter of uh, the right to asylum. Mm, the issues regarding the effectiveness uh, of the right to asylum of migrants that arrive in Europe uh, have been apparent for years now. Uh, the lack of implementation of the principle of solidarity between uh, member states uh, still represents uh, the fundamental issue in this matter. Uh, we know that uh, this uh, principle, the principle of, so of solidarity, is provided by the same uh, Lisbon Treaty, Article 67 and 80 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, as we know, the Dublin system under Dublin regulation and its core requires that the European states uh, that find themselves in a ge geographically disadvantageous position examine the asylum applications of migrants that arrive in Europe uh, through states such as Italy, Greece, uh, Spain, Malta. Uh, and then after several months of announcements, uh, also by the president uh, Ursula von der Leyen, of a, plan, of a plan aimed at overcoming the Dublin system's inefficiencies, the proposals enclosed in the new European pact look disappointing from my point of view. Um, these uh, new, the, the new solidarity uh, mechanism provided by the pact focuses on relocation and return sponsorship. Uh, the fifth issue with this framework, with this framework work, is that it does not provide for a mandatory and binding mechanism of relocation. Basic, basically, the problematic criterion of the Dublin regulation is maintained. Uh, there is no structural and binding relocation mechanism. Uh, there are no sanction, sanctions, economic of, or any kind uh, of sanction. Uh, no sanction imposed upon the states that refuse relocation. However, a system of sanctions would have been extremely important for an effective implementation of the relocation system and therefore for an, effective, for an effective implementation of the principle of solidarity between member states. Um, from that point of view, uh, the PACT's proposals on this matter could even be regarded as a, a step backwards if we compare them to the measures envisioned in recent years. For example, uh, I'm talking about the, European uh, the fact that the European Commission had already put forward in 2016 a set of proposals aimed at structurally overcoming the Dublin system. Um, let's talk about the second point uh, uh, of my presentation, uh, the action uh, against illegal immigration. Uh, returning illegal, uh, irregular uh, migrants to their home countries is a sensitive issue under many perspectives, uh, as it interacts with the matter of fundamental rights. We were, we were talking before of uh, human rights. This is a very uh, um, specific point that involves the matter of fundamental rights. Uh, for many years now, Starting with the Hogue uh, program of 2004, European Union and, and Member States uh, have elected return to third countries as a, an extremely important instrument in the management of migratory flows and control of uh, irregular migration. However, it is well known that this mechanism currently doesn't work, since only one third of the irregular migrants that should leave the European Union territory is actually returned, as the same pact itself notes. Uh, therefore, the pact 
aims to provide the efficiency of the measures of return by demanding to the member states better performances in the returns policies and proposing some amendments to the return directive of 2008. Um, however, the reason of the low level of efficiency in the returns uh, are deep and do not actually stem from inefficiencies of member states or uh, of national and European regulation on the matter. In fact, as we know, if there is no any cooperation, for example, through readmission agreements with the third countries, it is extremely difficult for irregular immigrants to be effectively returned. And as a matter of fact, member states and the European Union cannot and shall not enter into agreements with several third countries, uh, since in many cases, these states, these states do not assure an adequate standard of protection of fundamental rights and lack any form of protection of the right to asylum. I think that this is an objective limit to the possibility of returning immigrants to those countries. Also, the measure of uh, the voluntary return to the country of, uh, of origin, to the third countries, already enclosed in the directive, in the directive of uh, 2008, and the new plan wishes to reinforce is useful and reasonable in theory, but in practice has proven extremely difficult to implement. A proper and effective policy of voluntary returns would require a real implementation of a strong and structural partnership with the third countries. The matter of the partnership with the third countries is however an extremely complex issue as the dialogue with the governments of these countries is often difficult. In many cases, these are dictatorial systems and it will require a common European foreign policy. But as we know, uh, the lack of a common foreign po European foreign policy, policy today is still one of the main problems of the European Union integration process. If we, uh, if we analyze, um, if we take into account all these aspects and we analyze the plan's proposals to strengthen the efficacy of return policy, we can understand that these, uh, um, uh, these proposals are narrow and scarcely reliable. I'm talking about the proposal to recast the return directive of 2008, uh, the proposal of the pact to uh, um, give Frontex uh, a, a leading role in the common European system for returns, the, co the creation by the Commission of uh, uh, a return coordinator. I think that all these propo the, the, the proposals uh, could be not useful. I think that the probability that these proposals will actually increase the number of returns is extremely low. For these reasons, uh, I think that a more realistic policy should reduce the importance of returns of migrants. Expulsions, returns, refoulement alone are not enough to control uh, illegal immigration. And they also present a number of criticalities, starting from the protection of fundamental rights. I think that these measures could be maintained under the condition that their limits are properly assessed. I think that now it's time to modify the policies concerning the legal access of migrants. A more realistic management of migratory of immigration uh, that provides for a stronger, stronger opening to legal access in premise for economic migrants. 
I think that the change of this approach and new policies of, uh, uh, on legal access should become the main instrument in the, in the policies against irregular migration. For this reason, I think that the European Union must be bolder on the matter of immigration. Uh, the model that looks uh, at this phenomenon as a, an emergency uh, and that prescripts expulsions and uh, returns as the main solution must be overcome. Uh, in conclusion, mm, in my opinion, the, the new pact does not bring forward the much desired and proclaimed change of course towards a new common policy on migration. On the contrary, the pact seems, seems to reproduce the old methods of the last 15 years. This method generated many criticalities with regard to the protection of fundamental rights and did not promote a rational and effective management of immigration. I think that for these reasons, these reasons, in order to change the course, uh, it will be necessary to apply the principle, uh, the principle of solidarity between member states to a fair distribution not only of uh, asylum seekers, but also of economic migrants. I think that it's time for a bolder initiative by the European Union that radically changes the unions, the European Union's and national policies through the implementation of new realistic and reasonable rules on legal immigration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, to you, Filippo, for uh, bringing in uh, the legal dimension, although with a, a strong constitutional criticism also of the legal status quo in the field of uh, European asylum and migration law. Now, I very much regret uh, that, unfortunately, Vladislava has not joined us. As I said at the beginning, she had an emergency issue with her four-month-old child. I hope that's nothing bad, but obviously, uh, we understand that uh, is uh, the right priority for her. Uh, so I think at this point we should move straight into the Q&A session and we have a good 20 minutes uh, to um, discuss the multiple and important topics that our panelists uh, have raised in their presentation. Uh, I would ask anyone who would like to uh, raise a question to please um, send me a quick note on uh, the chat or raise your hand uh, electronically so that uh, either myself or Catherine or administrator can unmute you uh, and allow you to directly uh, raise the question. But uh, if I can already abuse my role as chair, uh, as people uh, reflect whether they want to come out and, and speak, uh, and since I have my mic on, let me maybe break the ice by asking directly a question to uh, to the three speakers. I think, uh, you know, what the, your three presentation put together uh, explained very nicely is uh, this situation of entrenchment uh, in the field of migration. And that is certainly a very interesting element for us in the bridge network because uh, all the other crises we are analyzing in our project have somehow evolved. I think as Leila has emphasized, uh, there has been sort of the critical moment where Europe has moved forward, but that is not true really uh, for, uh, for migration. Uh, ironically, uh, but I guess that's just a correlation, there's certainly no causation. The migration crisis is the one where COVID also did not play really a meaningful or, or major role. Uh, COVID was very important in the economic area. Think of next generation EU. COVID was important on the rule of law issue. Think of backsliding uh, and of course important in Brexit. But for migration, the impact of COVID uh, was, uh, was, less, uh, was less significant. Having said that, I'll come to my question. Uh, and, and, and that's really connected to the second bit of what we do at Bridge, uh, which is differentiated governance. So if, if the status quo is entrenched, if there isn't capacity to move beyond the cleavages between countries, uh, why isn't there a stronger pressure to do this separately? 
as a subset of, uh, of member state only. Why do we compromise so much with Visegrad, as Leila said, uh, uh, rather than try to move beyond Visegrad and do something without Visegrad? Uh, that, that would be, I think, a question I, uh, I have for uh, all of you. I see here um, Teo Lo Piparo, who is asking a question. Perhaps if the panelists agree, I could immediately give Teo uh, the, the, the floor so that he can probably ask his question uh, directly. Uh, Teo, I'm going to enable you to speak if you are able to do so, so that you can ask your question. I think you're now unmuted, so you can speak. Oh, hello there. Yeah. Hi, Thank Jeff. you, Federico. Great energy. Um, yeah, ju just a quick thing. I ju just feel like um, there is a lot of hate and, and rage against uh, the institution that we have so far. A um, lot of uh, uncontent and a lot of um, unsatisfaction, which is, is comprehensible. There is always space for improvement. Um, but I would like to um, continue from Susan because she she talked about belonging. It's really important. I, I worked in Ireland for seven years. Um, and I believe that belonging kicks in when you are needed. And I believe that you are needed when you have something or you can do something that people want. And um, we have talked about language barriers or security concerns. And I believe all those problems would fade away if um, you can provide something that other people need. Um, I think that, that the priority for me would be to increase awareness of entrepreneurship. Uh, it's really important for people to start to think that if they go in another country, if they start to migrate, um, they also need to start to think that um, some given are gonna be taken away. And that's the way it is. And it's up to you to make the effort to establish a, a, a persona that is gonna be accepted or rejected. But I believe that within within yourself if you go in another country thinking that you're going for asylum and that, that, I believe that's not a great start and there's no policy get, that can uh, protect you I think it's just a matter of mindset and it's important that wherever you go whatever you do um, you've got to create something that people love and every barrier will fade away so this is a yeah. question on belonging obviously tell uh, uh, some provocative thoughts yeah. there i'll stop you because i see two more questions sorry for cutting you absolutely. there absolutely absolutely is no. uh, and i'm gonna call uh, and i'm gonna call on him to ask his question uh jamie i think are you being enabled to speak now There you Hello. Are. I think you can go. You can hear me. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, my question was really, I mean, the the presenters really have painted quite quite a gloomy picture, perhaps, of the direction of travel in respect to refugee rights, resettlement, and the way that um, the way that things are going. Um, do the panelists? Yeah, I suppose I'm looking for signs of hope. I'm looking to see whether um, the panelists. Um, see any signs of hope for the future, any, any directions of travel that, um, that, 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 could improve, that could improve the situation in the future. Um, where are the green shoots? So looking for optimisms, Jamie, I'll pass on to Renata. We'll collect the third, well, fourth question now, really, uh, and then back to the panels. Renata, the floor is yours. Thank you. It, this was really fascinating. Thank you to, to all three of you. And actually, I have a, have a sort of a big big picture question 
uh, that would will also link some of the, the bridge themes, hopefully. So in the what well, one thing that that the crisis COVID brought on with Next Generation EU is a focus on the environment and climate change. Uh, we do recognize de facto uh, an increasing number of, of climate refugees who we actually do expect to, to increase in numbers. Now, the international refugee law is not particularly welcoming towards climate refugees. I mean, they are really not the only ones who are not recognized. Uh, but, but this is a particularly interesting tension where on the one hand, the new commission has very clear policy and very well stated and clearly stated policy preferences to which they are putting a lot of money. Uh, and I'm wondering whether, whether you see any kind of recognition and any kind of opening in both EU migration policy and especially refugee rights uh, for, 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 for any reflection or imprint of, of the recognition of the, of the climate crisis. And if, if, if there is absolutely nothing, then, then, then why is that the case despite the commission's strong preference? For, for, the, for, for the next term. Thank you. Thank you, Renat. I see there are other questions coming, but since there's quite a bit on the table already, uh, maybe I'll hand back uh, to the panelists for a quick uh, first round of, uh, of reaction. Uh, Leila, do you wanna go first? Shall we follow the same order? Yes, thanks. Um, that's fine with me. So thanks for all the questions and, and hearing with us and, and staying here, although it's getting dark outside and we're all getting tired, so really appreciate it. So I think maybe one of the first messages I want to give, because I think all of us as the speakers, we agreed on one point, namely the continuity of all these policy processes. So I think here we are completely all fine. But I think maybe I want to still emphasize one point, um, um, namely who is the one to blame, no? Because sometimes I hear like very much lamenting about, okay, why there is no more legal pathways where there is not. So I think also, I mean, we have to realize that the governance of asylum and migration is fragmented. So the European Union does not have any competences in the field of integration and in the field of legal migration. So I think this is also where do we shift the, um, yeah, the, the, the blame too. I think that's, that's an important point. And the second point is really these political realities. So that's why I thought so much, I think it's about more than just about um, going back to propositions like mandatory relocation, which have been already proposed. They haven't worked. So I think the problem is much more, and that's what I tried to highlight, much more substantial, substantive in the terms of political conflict. And I think here I want to um, jump directly to, um, to Theo, who I always like, people who want positive uh, messages, because there is always positive messages. And I think we really have to think about how we do uh, policy making, how, how politics is, is structured. And that's what I mentioned when, when I was thinking about input legitimacy. Um, so when we think about the broader problem of all these evolutions, of this uh, more and more um, backlash against transnational, against post-national, um, um, yeah, developments. I mean, it's really this these bigger issues about about trust in in in, in political elites, and and. But I think this we can tackle. There is instruments how to tackle this um, and to to change this. I think this is where we really have to think instead of uh, looking if we really want to radically change something. I think we won't change public opinion, and it's also the question always where do we want to because first public people don't change their mind, okay? So I think, and that also we should manipulate people, but we, we can uh, see how the political reality is what they perceive are. So I think that's one thing. And how, and then we could also take away um, the power of, of, of anti-migrant and anti-European entrepreneurs who now mobilize on the issue because they tap into the social political conflict. Um, so, um, and to your question about, about differentiation, 
I think, I mean, here there is a very good paper by Schimmel Fanning, and I tend to agree with him, who says differentiated integration doesn't work in the field um, of, of migration and asylum. Why? Because it's about redistribution. So if you think about it, if you just say, okay, we leave out the countries who aren't affected and who are now not willing to do something, namely the Wishikat countries, so there is the ones who remain are those who are affected. So there is no burden sharing mechanism, so to say. I think, and that's one of the main, main issues. But I think then again, it comes down, is it really a burden issue in terms of numbers or does it also irrespectively of numbers uh, is, a, is a burden and was what, that's what I mentioned with symbolic burden because of this politicization. So again, it comes back, uh, squares back the circle. Um, and also a very good question from Renata about the climate refugees. So I'm not an expert about current proposals in this field, I have to admit, but I think again, let's think broader. First of all, I think this is also part of a narrative, this threat of climate refugees. Because first, when as migration scholars, when we think about how does migration work, migration basically is not a global phenomenon. It's still very much a regional phenomenon. So, and if you think which countries would be um, most likely affected by climate change because they don't have the resources to tackle it. So it means this problem will be a problem of certain regions more than others. And also I think those most affected in, in, in very poor areas, they are, will be trapped by climate change. So it's not that this will increase migration, it rather will keep vulnerable people more vulnerable and trapped. So that's the first thing we have to think about when we think about the issue of climate um, refugees. Yeah, but that's thanks, thanks Leila. I'll, I'll, we'll have time to come back to this as well. Uh, Susan, floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you for these questions. I, I think they were all, in my mind, they somehow are related. Um, and maybe I can explain how. First of all, um, the question of entrenchment versus differentiated government. Um, I mean, one thing that I didn't raise, that hasn't been raised in this panel is the role of cities and local levels in integrating and being a really positive source of belonging for refugees. Um, so to me, that relates to the idea of, you know, signs of hope. I mean, there are many, you know, stories of um, cities, places, sanctuary cities, places where um, people and groups are really, um, you know, forming meaningful relationships. And um, so um, I think it's not all um, a sad uh, story. And um, Leila is right, we shouldn't, we can't only hold the EU responsible. There are these different levels at which things are happening. And so um, if we look to the cities, I think we see some, um, some positive uh, steps. Um, I think the question about, um, the, for me, the question about the, the, how does COVID affect migrants and should migrants be entrepreneurs? Those are two kind of interesting questions because on the one hand, COVID, you know, a lot of migrants are working in these kind of irregular frontline dangerous positions or there have been, you know, the meat, work, meat plant workers in Germany or the uh, seasonal workers that people have been worried about. In Turkey, a lot of migrants have lost their job completely and they have no social support now, so, uh, or no additional social support. So I think it is uh, affecting them actually, but maybe it's not in the public eye. Um, and this question about entrepreneurship um, is, it's a commonly raised question, I think, about how can migrants and refugees, you know, contribute to the society by starting their own businesses. Um, and that kind of relates to the, I, the question of legal economic migration, which is um, very underemphasized under in the pact. Uh, although I will say that uh, refugees are much more able to start businesses in Turkey. Uh, there's a lot, entrepreneurship is very high here compared to um, other European countries but it doesn't necessarily increase their societal acceptance, um, although maybe there's other reasons for that. So um, we could maybe, time will tell. Um, but uh, in terms of the climate change issue, um, I think, I mean, that's also not my field, but I, I think we need to look at it carefully. Uh, I mean, one thing that I've been thinking about uh, is how um, climate change, I think can, 
potentially be a way of kind of abdicating responsibility for the migrants. So for example, uh, Syrian migration, um, you know, there was a, there was a drought for uh, five years before, um, before civil war broke out. And part of the reason for that is because of dam projects in Turkey and government policies in Syria and Iraqi refugees. So there's a lot of political and geopolitical dynamics that create climate change uh, based migration I and mean, climate change is one of those issues. So I think um, if we just say, oh, they're, they're climate migrants, well, climate change, that's a really hard problem. What can we do about it? But there are actually like concrete political dynamics that exacerbate these, um, these climate dimensions. So I just hope that um, we keep that in mind. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And I'll move straight to uh, Filippo. Thank you for, uh, for uh, your questions. Uh, I would like to say something more optimistic uh, because, uh, uh, as you know, I didn't... Uh, there. <laughs> as you know, I didn't uh, appreciate uh, uh, the new pact. Uh, but uh, mm, at the same time, uh, I think that uh, uh, the future for uh, the governance, the governance of migration, the future is uh, um, must be created uh, inside the European Union common policy on migration and asylum. I mean, I don't believe that uh, member states uh, must uh, um, manage themselves migration and asylum problems. Uh, the solution uh, could be founded only within the European Union framework and within the European Union construction. This is the reason why I think that uh, we need for uh, um, a better intervention by the European Union. Uh, and this is the reason why I think that we should radically change the European Union approach on this matter. But we should also remember that uh, um, the problems uh, uh, of um, the common policy on migration of this year, uh, often uh, derived, uh, often uh, um, have been problems from member states. Federico, before uh, he was talking about uh, the Visegrad member states, this uh, could be a good example of problems related to migration uh, that uh, gen uh, generated, but not by the European Union uh, rules, but uh, by uh, national member states. So I think that the solution must be funded inside the European Union construction, but within a, a different approach. Uh, the other question uh, about uh, climate change and particularly about uh, uh, climate uh, refugees, it's a very uh, complex problem. It's a, very, it's a new problem. We must consider this question because at the moment, uh, uh, at the moment, there is a low protection by international law, but there is also a low protection by European Union law of the so-called uh, climate refugees. Uh, and I feel that, that this could be, uh, should be considered as a new form uh, of protection. I think that we should consider uh, uh, climate refugees as a, a and, and the matter of climate refugees as a new declination of the traditional asylum law. Um, so I think that we need a new form of protection under Article, Article 18 of the European Union Charter on fund, of Fundamental Rights, considering the matter of climate refugees as a new important, important matter of uh, asylum law and the right to asylum, of course. Thank you, Filippo. I want to go straight to my colleague, uh, Veronica Corcodel, uh, who I know has a couple of questions. She'll be chairing a panel tomorrow, but she's an expert on those topics. So I'm very happy to involve her. Um, Veronica, up to you. Hi, Federica. Thank you. And sorry, my camera seems to not be working. So, um... Uh, I cannot, you cannot see me, unfortunately, but there's a nice picture of me. Um, so um, thank you very much for your presentations. I think that this is, this was a fascinating panel uh, and many very interesting issues have been raised. And I have 
Um, two questions, one for Lila and uh, one for Susan. Um, for Lila, I was um, wondering if you could say a bit more about this uh, Portuguese attitude of depoliticiz depoliticization. Um, uh, I just want to know a bit more about your own understanding of what this depoliticization means. And personally, I'm always skeptical when I hear the word depoliticization and the immediate a uh, question that comes to my mind when I hear it is, uh, so what is the politics of this depoliticization? <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is my question for you. And um, uh, for Susan, um, uh, I, I, I wanted to say first that um, I think it's a very interesting lenses to look at the migration issue, this, this idea of belonging. And I think it's a very important uh, lens to adopt because as you said, this is uh, this is what allows us to sort of di directly relate to the needs of, of migrants. Um, and I was wondering um, uh, to what extent uh, you include more generally in, a work, in your work the issue of intersectionality of identities. So we know that in practice, so it's like there are several identities that overlap race, social class, religion, uh, gender, uh, and of course things get so much more complicated when uh, when we're talking also about migration, because then it's also um, uh, the idea of belonging to uh, to the to the new country, right? Um, so so yeah. So I was wondering um, to what extent you also include this is in, more generally in your, in your work, if not you know uh, in relation to the pact specifically, but more generally and and how this would sort of affect the, the solutions that you that you propose because you talk about and I think it's extremely important uh, you know this um, uh, the, the the idea of um, ensuring a secure legal status um, uh, to adopt integration standards and so on but then if you think also uh, uh, about this issue of intersectionality of identities then the picture gets so complicated that that even you know this basic I would say needs that migrants have legal status and integration standards they they would touch just a little bit just like an, uh, they would touch an important need but but really insufficient to arrive at at, at I would say a real feeling of belonging if uh, other identities are not um, addressed yes so. Sorry, it was a bit long. Thank you, Veronica. That's fine. Uh, I know we are short on time, but I want to give the floor also to Hava Yezid, who's one of my PhD students in, uh, in DCU working on the EU Turkey statement. Uh, Hava, the floor yeah. is yours. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for your great presentation. Uh, my question is for the Susan. Uh, actually, uh, as a result of the sexual harassment last year in Istanbul uh, by the by a Syrian man, uh, this created um, this create this makes the uh, Syrians targeted and uh, started attacks against the Syrian people, and it was almost uh, going to be burned by uh, their house by the Turkish people. Uh, my question is that the Islam, as you mentioned in your presentation, can make the Turkey a place where it is easier integration than Europe for Syrian in, in terms of the EU policy with Turkey, with a co cooperation with Turkey. Thank you. Thank you, Hava. So um, we are already running uh, beyond our time. Uh, Filippo, I don't know if you uh, want to add something at this stage, okay, there were no direct questions to you, so maybe we'll take it in reverse order with Susan uh, going uh, first uh, and then Leila. Uh, I'll just ask you to be brief to the extent that you can so that we take away too much of the coffee time. <laughs> oh, that's hard. Um, but I will just say, I mean, in terms of Veronica's qu question, I mean, that's an ex extremely good question and I definitely take intersectionality into account and it's really important and um, I mean if you're gonna look at belonging uh, I think you do need to differentiate men women age um, all kind of, you know where they live different uh, di different dynamic like yes so those I do look at I do look at those things 
Um, but I think you need really fine grained subtle research to get at the intersectionality and how it is affecting the belonging. And I don't know that um, we have that with our project, but I would like to do that more in the future, I think. Um, and so, yes, of course, that would uh, affect the uh, solutions that would be, um, you know, I think local level deliberations are really what a lot of scholars have pointed to as, you know, solving this problem of, of community inclusion or whether we want to call it belonging integration. So um, I guess that I wouldn't want, to, yeah, there's a problem with making a blanket solution when in fact what we need are people in situations working, working things out maybe. Um, in terms of this question of Islam it making, meaning that Syrians are maybe more comfortable in Turkey than Europe or are more accepted, I mean, I think that's a good question that we need a little bit more research on in the sense of um, how much is being produced by political discourse and how much is uh, I mean, there's a lot of dynamics that we need to tease out. Um, I mean, to some extent, since the ruling party made the inclusion of Syrians on the basis of them being religious brothers, then that's going to be the discourse that migrants are going to use and that others will use to, you know, include them. So, um, and then that discourse about how Islam is treated in Europe is itself also a discourse. So I wouldn't want us to like essentialize, you know, where Muslims are going to belong, I guess. Um, but uh, it's a question, I, 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 the way I think about it is that the migrants mobilize the discourses that around them that they feel they have to, to belong. And that, not that they only just parrot those discourses, but that they, they understand the milieu over time and they come to say and things that will be, you know, um, that they think will have resonance. But I mean, uh, I, I think there needs to be more research on that. So maybe maybe you can do that <laughs> for your dissertation. Okay, thanks for that encouragement. Uh, Susanna, Leila, the last word is back to you. Yes, I just want to add one very small point because I also think this belonging issue is extremely important. But I think one thing that we haven't touched upon, and so that's just, just the food for thought and for further cooperation and thinking, it's like, I think for belonging, also what is needing, needed is a feeling of being esteemed. So this is true for all groups that now feel alienated from politics and why we also see shifts in politics. And I think here COVID can be uh, essential because of these like uh, essential workers, which are also workers often from lower classes, which haven't seen lots of esteem. So I think, of course, coupled then also with financial um, uh, resources, but also this politics of esteem is extremely important for belonging. And to the question, I really like uh, Veronica's question, being critical, what does depoliticize, what the, what the politics of depoliticization are. But I think there is two different uh, differences we have to make, distinctions. So the one is making issues like migration apolitical. Like we often see in discourses from international organization. So like a win, 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 a triple win, whatever. So masking that there is, of course, like in every policy field, you have different interests, yeah? So this is politics. Politics is about different interests and then democratic politics is for me, um, how to arrange these different interests in, in, a, in a peaceful manner. Um, so this would be apolitical, but what I mean with politicization is, I mean that the issue like how it is debated in, in scholarly debate, that an issue is very salient, that it's polarized and polarized can be um, potentially very threatening for democracy because people don't arrange themselves anymore. They are just in two camps as we could now see also unfolding in front of our eyes in, 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 in the United States. And the second is, uh, the third component is that there is more actors. And what we see in Portugal, um, that it's much less salient the issue that we haven't seen such uh, anti-migration entrepreneurs like in other countries. This is what I mean with it. In this sense, it's less politicized. And in this sense, it can be a chance also to think uh, in, in, in a little bit other ways about migration and to proceed. This is what I meant, but I really like the question how to think of also about the politics and that it's important to think about issues like migration in political sense. Thanks so much for all of you again and yeah.
Wonderful. And thanks to all of you, to you, Leila, to Susan, and to Filippo, and, for, and to all the participants for being with us. Clearly, there is lots of issues at stake here. We've gone over time uh, to uh, start debating them, but the good news is there's more panel to follow. Uh, so I will uh, close panel one uh, now. We now have eight minutes for a quick coffee break. We are all at home, presumably, uh, so it's going to take less time than going to the cafeteria. Uh, but please don't leave this uh, Zoom call uh, because panel two takes place exactly on this screen. So I just suggest uh, you